our last group of eukaryotes that we're going to talk about in microbiology is the helminths. Helminths are unique in that they are the parasitic worms. Helminths are multicellular eukaryotic organisms that are still micro microscopic in nature. Occasionally they are going to be macroscopic as well. Helminths, um, when they are in adult specimens, are typically going to be large enough to see, be seen with the naked eye, but when they're there in their juvenile state, they are going to be microscopic in nature. Some flatworms are around, some helminths are non-parasitic in nature, and some will be parasitic in nature. Our parasitic helminths are going to spend a very large portion of their time living in our GI, or gastrointestinal tract. So let's talk about some helminths that you'll be commonly exposed to within a healthcare setting. We'll have flatworms, phylum platyhelminthes, also referred to as nematodes. These will have long, narrow, thin, segmented body plans and will be divided into the category cestodes and nematodes, so the tapeworms and the flukes. We also have roundworms, phylum ethashelminthes. This phylum of helminth has very elongated cylind cylindrical unsegmented body plans. So we can think of these, the roundworm category, as your traditional worm and that it doesn't have that segmented body plan, whereas the flatworms will have segmented body plans. So right here, because we can see that there's segmentation occurring, this is a big sign that we are looking at a flatworm. This is an adult stage of the flatworm, and as you can see, it's broken up into individual little segments. Each segment contains fertilized eggs, so as a segment breaks off, it's capable of ha repopulating another host. Here we can see a non-segmented helminth, and its smooth nature lets us know that this is going to be a round worm. Unlike the segmented worms, where each individual segment contains most of the structures needed um, or is capable of repopulating a host, for the round worms, when they go through reproduction, they typically need to transmit an entirely new worm to the host. We look at the general structures of the worm or morphology of our helminths. There are multicellular organisms, as I mentioned a few slides ago. They're going to have organs and organ systems within them. Now, these are simplified organs and organ systems, but still organs and organ systems nonetheless. Most of these worms are going to develop organs that are focusing on reproduction. These worms live in, most of the times, our GI tract. So they don't necessarily need to go through digestion themselves. They can just absorb nutrients that we've been digesting around them. Since the primary function or primary goal of these worms is reproduction, um, there's going to be less emphasis on digestion, excretory nervous and muscular systems, because they live in an environment that is ideal for absorbing nutrients and has an ideal temperature. All they need to focus on is reproducing. The life cycle of a helminth is fairly complicated. The complete cycle involves going from a fertilized egg to a larval stage to an adult stage. And depending on the species, there can be multiple hosts involved with this process. The adult helminths drive their nutrients and reproduce sexually in the host body. If we look at a nematode, the cell, these organisms are going to have separate sexes and it will be different in appearances. The trematodes um, can alternate between sexual and ace and um, will either have separate sexes, or if there is n only one gender available in a population, a trematode can switch genders. And then there's the cestodes, which generally speaking, switch genders as needed for sexual reproduction. If we look at our helminths, our helminths need to tra um, be transmitted um, in an egg or larval form to the body of a host. To make this happen, the larva is going to develop in an intermediate host. That intermediate host is typically used for transmission, and then once that larva gets into the final host, uh, it will form, or definitive host, it will um, form the adult stage and go through reproduction. If we look at human beings, we can have helminthes or parasitic helminthes get into our bodies from contaminated food, soil, water, or infected animals. Um, a common one, my wife is pregnant right now, so one that we're kind of worried about is staying away from cat litter boxes so she doesn't get toxoplasmosis. Um, 
Sometimes the infection can get in by an oral intake or penetrate unbroken skin. Oral intake is much more common than penetration of unbroken skin. Here are a, so, several species of helminthes that are of clinical significance. We can have Trichonoma spiralis um, that's present in pigs. And this is the reason that you need to cook pork very well. We can have Dronchunoas medicinalis or Oncore volvolus. Oncore volvolus is a parasitic helminthi that causes river blindness. We can have Enterobias vermicularis, also known as pinworm in human beings. Or we can look down here and we can see that we could have Schistomonosa japonicum which is a blood disease and causes blood diseases in human beings, or we will have the tapeworms that are also present in for pork or fish. If we look at our life cycles and go back to those life cycles, those fertilized eggs that are produced by the helminthes need to be released into the environment. Since they're being released into the, ex the environment outside of the house, they usually are going to have a protective shell and some food stores to help them make it to that larval state and get to that intermediate host. These eggs are going to be vulnerable to heat, cold, dry, and or predators, so they need to find that intermediate host quickly. S certain species of helminthes can lay 200,000 to 25 million eggs a day. So obviously most of these eggs never make it. But if just 1% make it, that's still a very high success rate. The pinworm, Enterobias vermicularis, also known as the seat worm, is going to cause an infection of the large intestine. These worms can be as small as 2 centimeters or as large as 12 centimeters and have a tapered cylindrical shape. A common shape, because usually it will be young children that are infected with tape, the uh, pinworm. A common symptom of the pinworm is itchiness around the anal opening as the worms are exiting the, jet, the uh, anus of the infected host. Um, they are visible with the naked eye. They are being used, measured in units of centimeters, so you can easily see them. So if you see a young child that's scratching their backside a lot or rubbing their butt on the ground, um, check their diaper, check their pants, and see if they have pinworms coming out of their anus. The pinworm has microscopic eggs that can get into an infected person from anything they've touched or from their food sources. Those eggs will then hatch in the small intestine and then mature into adults in the large intestine within a month. Within the large intestine, they're both male and female worms that will reproduce. The females are going to migrate to the anus to deposit eggs at the anus, and this is where that itching occurs. Scratching the anus is what's used uh, the primary modes, mo method of egg spreading. So here we can see a uh, larger female, a smaller male worm, and the ascending colon of this cute little girl. They will form eggs. Um, those eggs are going to then cause the little girl's anus to itch. She scratches her butt and then spreads them to the little boy. And a new host is infected once he puts his fingers in his mouth. If round worms don't motivate you to wash your hands after going to the bathroom, I don't know what will. There's approximately about 50 parasites of helminths that will parasitize humans. They are all over the world. They are clearly going to be in higher concentrations in tropical areas because there's more water present, so it's easier for those eggs to be transported in the external environment. If we look at the number of cases that occur every year, it's estimated that billions of infections with helminthes occur every year, but most of these are in developing countries and are not properly diagnosed and confirmed. Conservative estimates of helminth infection rates in North America range on the 50 million range, so 50 million helminthy infections every year in just North America. So, concept check. Let's pause for a moment and see if you can find the answer. Adulthood and mating of helminths occurs where? In the larva, the intermediate host, the cyst, the definitive host, or the egg? If you don't know the answer, you can pause the video and go back to find the answer or flip back in your PowerPoint. One, two, three, four, five. All right, hopefully you've looked up the answer at this point. The answer is D, the definitive host. That's all we have for our discussion on eukaryotic cells. If you have any questions, shoot me an email or post them to the discussion board.
Happy studies!